Okay. Right. Or not. So next week at this time, we'll have you'll have looked at all the information in the videos on eating disorders, and we'll have discussion on questions about eating disorders and disordered eating, but then we'll also have a discussion on your collages. So this is the second required assignment, and basically it's a collage. What I ask you to do is go through your media and cut and paste into an eight and a half by 11 pictures, advertisements, anything that you think might have an effect on food choices. And do I ask you to write one or two pages on whether or not you think that these advertisements have an effect on the development of eating disorders? What's on the right, I had a student one semester who didn't make a collage, but he drew this. So if you have any artistic abilities and you wish to use them, then by all means, draw something. So the purpose of this is to have a discussion on the effect of media, if you think there is any effect of media on food choices and on the development of eating disorders. So that's the assignment. You don't, don't have to send it to me until after class because I want you to have it. Of course, if you send it to me, it means you already have a copy of it, right? Okay, well, if you want to send it to me before class, fine, but you'll have it with you for discussion, okay? That's the assignment for next week. And for those of you that are sending in assignments, that's great, thank you, I'm reading them. It gives me something to do. All right, let's have current events. Steven. Um, so. That's my current event, shouldn't be there. I didn't see that, yeah? Um, I did my current event on micro, Bile DNA in patient blood may be telltale sign of cancer. Oh, of cancer. Okay. What, what is it? My, microbial? Uh, microbial DNA or microbial DNA. Huh. Um, and the source is from the University of California, and it was on um, Science Daily, and... So basically from a simple blood draw, microbial DNA may reveal who has cancer and what type and even like in the earlier stages of cancer. And so basically right now, current liquid biopsies aren't yet able to rely to reliably distinguish against normal genetic variations from true early cancer. And they're hoping that this new one will be able to do that much more effectively than it can right now. Wow. And, and um, so yeah, they're thinking that it'll probably be able to read the earlier stages of cancer. And but the, one downside that it has currently is that Sometimes in like rare cases, it can come up with a false negative. And for this reason, it, it's not yet FDA approved for diagnosing cancer, but they're hoping to fix that so that it can be used in the future. What, is it all kinds of cancer? Is there a specific type of cancer it's referring to? Um, they said They said the stages that it's helpful for, but like they said, um, it works for all stages, but um, it works more like most effectively on like the mid to later stages. Well, so when we talk about cancer in a few weeks, cancer, all cancers are, are graded and staged. Depending on the staging and the grading of the cancer, that may determine the treatment. Um, so that's why I was asking you, is it all cancers or is it just a specific type of cancer? Um, it I'm may not, sure. not be clear in the article. Would you mind sending me the link and I'll have a look at it? I'm sure. Okay, thanks. Okay, Max. I uh, got my article for my current event from Science Daily as well. Uh, the source was from Stanford University and they published it on March 20th. 
Uh, it was about a new device that brings silicon computing power to brain research and possibly prosthetics. So basically, um, there's this new device um, that is uh, composed of a bunch of tiny, like smaller than human hair length wires that uh, are inside like a little ring that um, right now they've tested on rats and a little larger uh, animals, but you put it into the brain and it's minimally invasive. And apparently um, the silicon can like, silicon chips can read um, those like electrical brain waves and neuronal movements, kind of like a movie compared to like just taking pictures. So that it's more like an innovation of some kind of brain machine interface device that already exists, but it can uh, take much more detailed like actual movies of it. And uh, another cool thing was uh, the silicon's based on like a modified uh, camera chip. So yeah, and uh, as I said before, they're working toward applying it to prosthetics specifically like um, speech assistance because uh, a lot more prosthetics um, might need uh, more acute kind of brain studies. So what made you interested in this? Uh, I saw it pop up on Science Daily and it's just cool that uh, we as a society are focusing more on uh, devices to understand the brain because we really don't know that much about it yet. So a good thing we can do is fine tune what we have to study it at least. Okay. All right. Thank you. Eric G. So I found an article um, titled Too Much Salt Weakens the Immune System. So I basically was interested in it because I obviously know that high salt diets kind of are bad for blood pressure, but I didn't know about the you know effects on the immune system. So this study comes from the University of Bonn and there were both mice that were tested and human volunteers as well, um, both of which showed immune deficiencies to bacterial infections. Um, so the human volunteers consumed about an additional um, six, grams, six, six grams of salt, um, kind of equivalent to the amount of salt in two fast food meals. And um, another kind of aside to this study said that um, because the skin kind of acts as a, as a reservoir for salt in the body, um, the increased salt diets actually improve the body's response to some skin diseases. Um, increased salt? Did increased that? salt improves the body's response to skin diseases. Um, but most of the study was kind of focused on how the kidneys filter out salt from the body. And a side effect of the process was the inhibited function of something called granulocytes. Hopefully I'm not botching that. Yeah, no, you are. Somebody in, my, in the nutrition class had that same article. Yeah. Yeah. So I um, corrected him. So <laughs> it's okay. What, how do you say it? No, you said it right. He did. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, so I guess this is the most common type of immune cell in the body and it typically attacks bacteria. So the blood samples from the volunteers that ate that extra salt, um, showed that the immune cells coped much worse to bacteria, um, after starting the diet. So my question, uh, first of all, that like a lot of that part of that study was done on mice, right? Yeah. And the other part was done on healthy volunteers, right? Because yeah. And what they did was they gave these vol these volunteers ate that additional salt, mm -hmm. and then they withdrew blood and then tested that blood against like a bacteria. Right. So it wasn't exactly in the human body. So we don't. When right. we talked about the immune system, there are other things that respond to an infection besides granulocytes. So that's just what that was just something I was yeah. thinking about that that they were. I mean. I don't know how you know. I don't know how else they do the study, but that was something that I thought about. That our immune system is not just the granulocytes; it's the natural killer cells, it's the T cells, it's the B cells, it's all these other things. So um, I was just wondering how effective it is in in a real world situation. That's yeah, not too, not too sure. Obviously, they kind of <laughs> tested that specific case. Sure. 
But the other thing that, that I brought up because, well, you mentioned it and my other student mentioned it, except he said, we know that salt causes high blood pressure. We don't right. know that salt high, causes high blood pressure. We know that that's a big recommendation for people who have high blood pressure. We tell them to cut back on their salt, but only 25% of the population is actually salt sensitive. So for them, taking out salt from their diet can improve their, their um, blood pressure numbers. The thing is that most of the salt that we get in our diet, that a lot of people get in their diet, comes from processed packaged food. And so it may not be that they're getting too much salt, but you know, by eating all these ultra processed foods, they're not getting enough of other things that may improve their blood right. pressure. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting that somebody looks like somebody got a paper out of it, so. <laughs> Good, Sunil, where are you? Uh. Maybe on my uh, other screen. There you are. <laughs> uh, I have two. They're both from Science Daily. Um, and the first one, it's called Engineers Model Mutations Causing Drug Resistance. Um, it's dated March 24th. And the uh, source is Penn State. And I think they were trying to find like a way to predict which mutations will occur in people. And they said instead of looking at most drug resistant mutation, they were trying to target at the most probable mutation. Um, they used uh, existing data for leukemia and three other types of cancer. And the reason they did that was because leukemia database was the largest and most complete. And they tried to create a um, more general approach um, to getting the numbers for the model they were trying to create. Um, and they said that likeliness of a mistake and not the reduction in the sensitivity to the drugs uh, would be better at predicting the uh, resistant mutations that patients could develop. And um, the article said it was uh, still incomplete and it's work in a pro progress. Okay. Hmm. And what's your um, Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, and my second article, uh, it's called Regular Tub Bathing Linked to Lower Risk of Death from Cardiovascular Disease. Um, I thought it might be that the two might be uh, related to each other, your two articles. This one's totally different. <laughs> okay. Is, uh, um, yeah, uh, it's also dated March 24th, and the source is the uh, BMJ British Medical Journal. And um, the first sentence of the article said that uh, regular tub bathing is linked to a lower risk of death from heart disease and stroke, uh, indicates a long-term study published online in the journal. And uh, they said it's associated with good sleep quality and better self-related health. And then um, they said it's not clear what its long-term impact might be on cardiovascular disease risk, including heart attack, third, uh, Sudden uh, cardiac death and stroke, which uh, kind of goes against what they just said in the first sentence. And um, the study itself was pretty good. Um, it was uh, the length of the study was 19 years, and they uh, the population. It was a population-based tracking study, and it was more than 61,000 middle-aged adults. But the sample size was restricted to um, just Japanese population, which is like very limiting to the rest of the world. And it was an observational study and there was a correlation. So there's like no causal relationship. So um, yeah, that's it. That's, yeah, well, so yeah, so 19 years is a long time. I'm wondering that they send out questionnaires at the beginning, the middle and the end, do they? Yeah, um, they, they, send out, they sent out questionnaires, did all the um, health checkups at the beginning. Okay. And they did a regular follow up with the um, subjects until the end mm -hmm. uh, when they ended at 2009. So, yeah. And the taking baths is good for your heart health? Um, they said that there was. Even um, if smoking cigarettes? <laughs> uh, they said there was a correlation that there was a um, more bath um, tub bathing and the lower risk lower death from cardiovascular disease was linked 
but it was just a correlation, so. Right, and it's just one thing. I mean, that, that when, when we hear of these one things, remember, it, it, it should be part of a lifestyle because I could read this study and say, oh, if I'm gonna start bathing, why should I give up smoking? Because that's mm -hmm. gonna take care of it. So, okay, well, but I like bad, so I, I approve this study. All right, thank you, Eric L. Come on, Eric. Hi, um, I actually thought mine on the syllabus <laughs> was the next class. Oh, all right. Well, I'm sure it's in your thing somewhere. If you look for it, we'll just keep going. Or I can wait till next class. That's fine. Sorry, yeah. No problem. It is possible that things are out of whack. Next. So Kaylee, am I right having you for today? Yeah, I think I have two for today though. Oh, right. You asked me. Okay. Maybe it was you that was times two. Sorry, Eric. Okay. So the first one I found was titled molecule found in oranges could reduce obesity and prevent heart disease and diabetes. So researchers are studying a molecule found in sweet oranges and tangerines called nobiotin, which has um, shown to drastically reduce obesity and reverse its negative side effects. So this was conducted at Western University and was published in the Journal of Lipid Research. And what they did was they fed um, one group of mice a high fat, high cholesterol diet and gave them nobiotin. And then they fed another group of mice a high fat, high diet cholesterol, but they weren't given that molecule. Mm -hmm. And they found that the mice that were given nobiotin were noticeably leaner and had reduced levels of insulin resistance and blood fats compared to the mice that didn't have nobiotin. Um, and overall, they're unsure of the exact way of how it works, but they hypothesized that the molecule was likely acting on the pathway that regulates how fat is handled in the body. Hmm. So what do you think about that? I mean, it's interesting, but obviously it's just in mice, so they don't Very good. really know how realistic it is. In mice. Yeah. Okay. And then... My second one was titled Impaired Driving Even Once the High Wears Off. So researchers have discovered that recreational marijuana use affects driving ability even when users are not intoxicated. Um, they found that cannabis users had more accidents, drove at Wait, higher speeds. I just stop you a second? Impaired, yeah. what, what was the title? Impaired Driving Even yeah. Once the High Wears Off. So when somebody's high, they're calling that intoxicated now? They're not just high, they're intoxicated? I impaired i guess yeah oh i thought i heard you say intoxicated sorry uh no i mean they do use intoxicated throughout the article so i guess they're using that now i didn't get the memo i, I didn't either interesting <laughs> um but so they found that cannabis users had more accidents drove at higher speeds and drove through more red lights than non-users and basically how they conducted their research was they used a customized driving stimulator to assess the potential impact of cannabis use on driving performance. And they made sure that those who were the marijuana users in the research um, had not used for at least 12 hours. And they found that heavy marijuana users demonstrated poor driving performance compared to non-users. And in the stimulated driving ex exercise, the marijuana users hit more pedestrians, exceeded the speed limit more often, made fewer stops at red lights, and made more center line crossings. Um, and when they had like originally divided the groups into like marijuana users and non-users, they found that significant driving impairment was detected and localized to those who began using marijuana regularly before the age of 16. Um, and overall they claimed it wasn't necessarily a surprise because other research has consistently shown that early substance use is associated with poor cognitive performance. But overall I feel like it's more of like a correlation than it is a causation. Yeah, but don't be stoned and dry. <laughs> well, obviously, yeah. <laughs> well, not. I guess my questions, and again, that would be my overall recommendation. If you're going to be altered, don't drive. Mm -hmm. But how were they determining the potency, you know, how strong? Like when we talk about alcohol, yeah. we can say how many drinks. We can say over how long a period of time. But we don't have that information with cannabis yet. Yeah. Again. Don't smoke, drink, and drive. You'll die. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Alicia, what do you have? 
So I have I heard your glasses glaring. Why are my glasses glaring? Has anybody come up with a reason for me? I don't know. That's it's weird. Okay. So my article was titled, Newly Discovered Brain Response to Obesity Drug May Inform Future Treatments. Um, so this was from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, published in Science Transitional Medicine. Um, so just so like a summary. Um, so they're talking about an FDA approved drug. Um, it's a weight loss drug called Liraglutide, I think that's how you say it, um, which has been shown to help obese patients lose weight by suppressing their appetite. Um, however, where and how the drug acted in the brain, they never fully understood until recently. Um, so it basically showed that this lir liraglutide right. drug crosses the brain's <laughs> blood barrier to engage with a region of the brain stem called NTS, which is responsible for balancing food intake and energy expenditure. Um, so through lab um, rat trials, um, they were able to reduce um, this receptor, it's called GLP receptor, um, and that receptor um, is to suppress hunger in different parts of the brain. So reducing the receptors weakened the effects of the drug over three weeks, um, and the team was able to confirm that the presence of that receptor on GABA neurons in that part of the brain um, block the food intake and body weight suppression reduced by the drug. Um, and it kind of, at the end, just said that the discovery opens up the door for future obesity drug treatments that could be used. Um, the more that they understand about how the drugs act, um, they're able to manipulate um, combination of drugs um, to target specific parts of the brain. So I thought that was really interesting. Now, is this an animal study? Yeah, it was in rats. So it's not in human trials yet. So, yeah. mm -hmm. well, that would be a next step. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, Michael. Yeah, so I was scrolling through Instagram the other day and I saw a video of Donald Trump calling coronavirus the Chinese virus. And a lot of reporters like gave him a lot of backlash for it. And he said he wasn't gonna do anything about it. And now there's a lot of Asian Americans that are at risk or targeted with like racial slurs. And there's a lot of tension between China and America right now. And this just adds to it. Um, but yesterday, Trump said that he will no longer call it the Chinese virus. So that's my current event. Okay. But the G7 couldn't come to a consensus on talking about this situation because the U.S. insists on calling it the Wuhan virus and not the coronavirus. Exactly. Well, that's a different class, so we don't have to talk about that here. Okay, Ava, what do you have for us? Um, so I found an article that was about how quarantine is affecting people's eating habits. Yeah. It's not like a scientific report, but I thought it was pretty interesting. It was saying that- The container that of pecan praline, praline pecans. Yeah, it's saying that anxiety and boredom are leading people to do a lot of like stress eating and overeating. Um, and it's especially difficult for people who are recovering or are dealing with eating disorders oh. because it gives them kind of like a way to rationalize their behavior. Yeah. Like either hoarding food or like rationing it. Um, and then it also brought up a really interesting point of this thing called orthorexia which is when people are like obsessed with having a clean like diet. And this is like coming out now because people are trying to boost their immune systems, but it really can kind of lead to like unhealthy um, diets and like missing out on some certain nutrients. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was kind of interesting because I know like I've been bored and like eating during quarantine, um, but like I never thought of it as, like how it can affect people who already deal with um, disordered eating. Right. right. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. It, that is a good point. Yeah. Somebody in my other class had brought that up too. It is. And, and what, well, maybe it's a different article, but, but her article said people maybe should have planned times to eat and stick to the schedules. 
Um, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows right now. But in terms of orthorexia, what I ask you to the videos I made for next week, we'll be ta talk about orthorexia. Uh, as I, kn I know that most people have heard of anorexia and bulimia, but I think your demographic is at risk for orthorexia because of all the media attention to clean eating, organic eating, you know, just what you're supposed to do and all those rules. So I will talk that that's, that's my concern. Yeah. We'll talk about that next week. I think we're going to learn a lot, but hopefully when we're looking back on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Orlando. Hi. Um, so I found mine from the medical journal of the American Academy of Neurology. Um, and there is stated that taking a low dose aspirin once a day does not reduce the risk of thinking and memory problems like uh, cognitive impairment or probable Alzheimer's, um, nor does it slow the rate of cognitive decline. Um, and the belief behind that was that the anti-inflammatory and blood thinning properties of aspirin, um, they reduce dementia because it reduces inflammation in the brain and minimizes uh, clots and prevents narrowing of blood vessels. Um, so the way they conducted the study was uh, it was 19,114 uh, participants who did not have dementia. The majority were 70 or older, and they took um, thinking and memory tests at the start of the study and during like annual follow-ups um, after like physical examinations. Um, half the participants were given 100 milligram aspirin, and the half were the other half were placebo, and it went on for an average of 4.7 years per participant. Um, and of that, 575 developed dementia, and they found that there was not necessarily any difference between the groups, but um, some concerns that they had was that the majority of the participants were older people rather than starting young and seeing if it were like how the effects of the long term. Mm -hmm. um, so they want to start it again, but conduct it on younger people, maybe at 40, and see how long and try to do it for like 10 years or 15 years to see if there's any longer uh, effects. And then also, all the participants were healthy, so they don't ha really have like information on how it would affect someone with dementia, if it would slow the decline right, right. or if it would prevent it, or not prevent it, but it would just slow it down a little bit. Right. Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I've heard of aspirin being used for folks who've had heart attacks or, or strokes mm -hmm. as, as a blood thinner. And, even, and there's a question of whether or not that, that has an effect because of aspirin's blood thinning properties because aspirin also can affect your intest your stomach lining and cause ulcers so it would be interesting how would they you know their study population with somebody volunteer who's at risk with somebody volunteer how would they get their study population but yeah you're right that the the study population is important and the length of time is important what made you interested in that um honestly i was just scrolling and that was the headline that uh <laughs> I kind of saw because um, I always thought of aspirin as for like uh, heart disease and stuff like that, but then I never really thought about it for dementia. Oh, okay. So I yeah, I hadn't either. That's why I thought you were going to talk about it. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, folks. So I have a current event that I just saw today, which was, I can't, I have you on the top. Can you become immune to the coronavirus? That's a question about, well, it's likely that you can, at least for some period of time, which is, an open, which is opening new opportunities for testing and treatment. So for people who are surviving the coronavirus, that means that they're not, if you're getting sick, the idea is that what's happening is your immune system, we talked about, you know, it has breached your, your first line of defense, your second line of defense, and it's stimulated your T cells and your B cells. And if you recover from it, does anybody, well, never mind, I'll tell you. The idea is that you have memory cells left. And so what they, what folks want to try to do is see if they can get the antibodies from people who survived coronavirus and use that to treat people who are really sick with it. And this article, I, they're just starting to look at something like that. This is something that they're looking at in China. And this would be, we talked about different types of immunity. We talked about active immunity and passive immunity. So if you're giving somebody the antibodies to treat something they already have, that would be passive immunity, right? Because they're not, they're not making the memory cells. They're being given antibodies to treat what they already have. A vaccine, on the other hand, when that gets developed, 
will give you the ability to make your own memory cells so that you can fight it in the future. But for people who are really sick right now, if this is something that can treat somebody who is very sick, that would be amazing. So that's my current event. Thank you. Okay, let's see, what do I want to have next? What I wanna do now, let me get out of here, is I'm going to break you into discussion groups. And uh, if you look at your email, you'll see that I sent you the four questions. So this is going to automatically break you magically into four groups. And then I will come into each group one at a time and see how the discussion's going. Then we'll get back into the classroom and make sure everybody knows what's the, how, what I'm looking for, what you might have gotten from all the different questions. And just as a reminder, because when, exam, when we do the exam, when we have an exam, what I intend to do is give you a number of different questions from which you can pick some, but I intend to use some of these discussion questions as your choices, okay? So that's the next part. So I'm gonna break you into four rooms. And then you can go to your room. I love it when this happens. <laughs> That's so cool. Randomly, then, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> How are you doing, folks? Good. How are you? Oh, all right. So, you have your question? Yes. All right. So, I'll be back just to make sure to so see what you've come up with. I haven't given you any time to discuss it yet. So, all right. So, we we'll explain how service. Everybody, the riddle. You're all here. Who is Henry Richard in the dark room? Is that you, Ethan? Yeah, I'm using my brother's laptop because mine is difficult to work with this stuff. So I couldn't imagine I anybody with my brother. Okay, well, thank him. I wasn't sure somebody would just volunteer to come to class today. But yeah. Cool. All right. So you guys see which question's yours? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Then go be brilliant. I'll be back. Okay. Uh, hypertrophy is the increase in the size of cells and hyperplasia is uh, the increase in the number of cells. All right, so you guys have your question. Everybody's here. I'll give you some time to discuss it and then I'll come back and see how you're doing. Yeah, sounds good. All right, see you in a bit. Yeah, are we only doing the fourth question? Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh. I came here just in time. Yes, you're just mm -hmm. fourth question. You're group number four, and mm -hmm. you're doing the fourth question. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk about it. Then I'm just going to cycle through the rooms and see how everybody's doing, and then we'll go back to the classroom and talk. Okay. Cool. See you in a bit. Okay, let's just go to school. All right, what brilliant things did y'all come up with? So we draw down a couple notes based on surface area affecting metabolic rate and how fashion metabolism 
uh, goes compared to a condensed versus kind of like a elongated or larger surface area. Okay. So <clears throat> we found that, well, based on the PowerPoints and what you said before, uh, someone who's taller would have a larger surface area, so therefore would have a faster breakdown, uh, faster met metabolic rate, especially during sleep, versus something that has a smaller, or someone has a smaller surface area. And the comparison you used in your PowerPoint, I believe, was a, a two by two cube versus a like eight stack cube, or eight stack kind of. Right, they both had eight cubes. Mm -hmm. but one was two by two and one was just stacked. Right, and the one that was longer would have more surface area, so a faster breakdown. Okay, and what else do you think that larger surface area, what else do you think that affects besides you know, what you're saying metabolism, why do you think it increases energy expenditure? Because it takes longer for the energy to like travel because it has more distance to go. Mm, I don't think that's what I was looking for, but that's an idea. <laughs> what I was, well, what I'm looking for, that doesn't mean that's not true. I don't quite understand the mechanism for that. But what, for me, what it has to do, one of the things it has to do with maintaining normal body temperature. When you have a larger surface area exposed to the environment, it, you, it takes more energy to warm that body up. Imagine if you're out in the cold, one of the first things you might do is get, make yourself smaller. You would decrease your surface area, which would help keep you warmer. You would have less surface area exposed to, to keep warm. Whereas if you stand up straight, you have a larger surface area exposed and keeping your body, body temperature is one of the things that burns calories, maintaining body temperature. Folks who have fevers tend to have a higher metabolic rate, a higher calorie expenditure while they have that fever. I don't recommend getting sick as a weight control method, okay? Don't try to lose weight by getting sick. But when you are, when your body temperature, when you need to, your body is producing heat, that takes energy, that energy is calories. So the person who has more surface area exposed is the one that's going to be burning more calories for at least maintaining body temperature. And I'm not sure, and you may be correct, Amanda, I just, I, in my head, I'm not sure how that works in terms of energy because you have cells all over your body that are producing energy. So I'm not sure that, that, that's, that, um, that that's what you're talking about. But in terms of heat, you're right. Blood does have to flow throughout the body. I don't know how much a calorie difference that makes. Um, okay. But I do know that maintaining body temperature, is, it's, that's the one example I think of. And that's why a larger surface area required it is involved or so you know has a greater expenditure folks that are taller versus folks that are smaller so that's mine so try to own that information and pick somebody who when we get back into the classroom can explain that because other people that that's the example i'm looking for if you have something else like you were saying and there was a reason for it i i would like to understand it but that's like the one reason i was thinking of but i'm sure there's more than one honest i'm sure all right, and if you, when you're done talking, you can go back to the classroom before I close out, which actually is kind of fun, but. Okay. All right, leptin ghrelin people, what have you come up with? Um, so we were saying that if you had to make a weight loss drug, you'd want to put leptin in it because that's what suppresses hunger. Uh-huh. And okay, so what's the difference between leptin and ghrelin? Well, um, basically leptin suppresses hunger and ghrelin kind of like increases hunger. And um, I, I think leptin is present in like, uh, or higher leptin levels are present in thinner people and that like increasing your eating of like trans fats and sugar increases ghrelin levels. Oh, does it? That's, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, I would have to maybe send you some sources because I know how I that usually goes sources. for me. <laughs> well, I think that you, so what I was thinking of, first of all, do you any, do any of you remember the set point theory that I talked about or what the set point theory refers to with weight control? Yeah. Isn't that like your body has like a set weight and it'll oscillate like 10 pounds right. below it? So how do you think leptin and ghrelin are involved with this set point theory? So when you start to lose weight, 
the ghrelin will kick in so that you're more hungry. Right. And then when you gain weight, the leptin will kick in so you're not. And that's a hypothesis. I don't know how to test it, but that's the hypothesis behind the leptin and ghrelin or the set point theory. Right. And so, yeah, Ava, you say if you were going to make a drug, you might make leptin. And in the video, I talked about a, I gave the example of a, a boy at three who was really severely, was very overweight. They found out he was leptin deficient. And when they gave him leptin, it regulated his appetite and energy expenditure. And when that happened, the world thought, you know, the obesity treatment people, whoever wanted, thought that that was the answer for everybody, but it only works if you're leptin deficient. However, if you were designing a medication on either end, perhaps if you were designing a medication that was targeting leptin, since leptin lowers appetite, maybe what you'd wanna do is enhance leptin like make the cells more receptive to the leptin the body's producing. On the other hand, if you were targeting ghrelin, then maybe you'd want to try to create something that would suppress ghrelin so that it would suppress appetite. There are other hormones, there's neuropeptides, and there have been medications designed to work at that kind of level of suppressing uh, hormones that increase or stimulate appetite or enhance hormones or chemicals in the body that reduce appetite so if you were that would be one way to to try to assess you know how you might do that and you would start with animals and you progress your way through the the gauntlet but so make sure you own that information and then when you're ready go back to the classroom and then one of you can share your knowledge with everybody all right i'll see you in a bit Hello, geniuses. What do you know about hypertrophy and hyperplasia? And hypotheses about obesity? So, um, okay. go ahead. No, you got it. You got it. Good job. All right. I'm out of here. No, what? So, hyperplasia was when these cells uh, increase in number. Mm -hmm. Hypertrophy is when the cell increases in size. So a lot of the stuff said that hyperplasia was a more like seemed to be more of a problem, like kind of a growth type thing. And hypertrophy seemed to be uh, related to weight gain and stuff and also uh, muscle building like there was a reference to hypertrophic exercise oh there was I, rec lifting, I referenced or, or, um, lifting weights was a uh, oh, okay yeah, example yeah. of hypertrophic so hype when we're talking about muscle building that's hypertrophy of the muscle tissue okay. so but with this question i was asking about hypertrophy and hyperplasia of fat cells but yeah you're right about muscle People think okay. that you need to eat lots of protein in order to build muscle, but it's using muscle so that the muscle increases in size. That's how you build muscle. But with respect to fat and weight, how do you think, how does this, which cells do you think are more involved in weight loss or weight control? Probably the number of cells. Because? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I feel like like you could have an excess number of cells. I was thinking more like when we were talking about it, I was thinking like quantity versus quality almost. Like if you have Wait, a lot I more of those cells, you may kind of more tinny. like fat. I can't, can you say that again? It got kind of tinny. Yeah, my, my connection is really, really bad right now. Um, okay. But I, I was thinking more like quality versus quantity when you have more of like a uh, quantity of them you mm -hmm. may have like excess fat maybe a result of like weight gain or maybe even like a cause of weight gain and then when you have like a bigger cell that could be like muscle building and there's less of the excess cells maybe i, I was kind of guessing on that but i that's kind of what i got from that i don't know maybe i'm wrong but yeah you could be i i couldn't tell because your connection's bad but oh yeah. <laughs> I'm Any other to get started. Is that okay? Because I keep I keep getting kicked out of there. Um, 
I'm recording this, so ultimately you'll be able to watch it again when you have nothing to do at three in the morning. So, you know, you can. Does anybody else have any idea or suggestions on what you think, how to answer this question? Yeah, I think like, I remember reading about how, um, like during a weight loss, the size will decrease, but the number wouldn't because it's already there. So I guess my answer is like hyper, hyperplastic is worse if that's the question i it's it, it's an answer and it's like it's a question yeah yeah so we have the, and again this is another hypothesis i don't know how you would test this unless you were drawing core fat samples from people over time as they were trying oh my arm disappears from the uh, over time while they're trying to lose weight but yeah, with hypertrophy, it's increase in size. With hyperplasia, it's increase in number. And when you lose weight, when intake is less than expenditure over time, you decrease the size of the fat cell, according to this hypothesis. But you don't decrease the number of fat cells. So they can shrink in size because you're pulling fat out of them because you're using, you need the energy. And that energy is drawing on your fat stores. But, so that hypothesis then says that some people feel that one of the reasons why they put on weight quickly is because they have all those fat cells that are ready to take up any excess energy that the body may be consuming. Again, it's a hypothesis, but it's about hypertrophy and hyperplasia. And I don't know how you decrease the number of fat cells unless you were doing liposuction. And that's a pretty drastic measure. And it doesn't mean that you won't gain fat. It's just that in that one area of the body where you remove the fat, you won't gain it, but you will develop increased cell size in, around that area, which probably looks odd. So yeah, I think Sharon, that that's what she said. Okay. So kind of try to own that in the next couple minutes and then go back to the classroom. I'm just going to check with the last group. And then I just want to make sure everybody has all the information and then we'll say goodbye. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Hi, kids. <laughs> Talk to me about brilliant answers for this question. Um, so we based a lot of um, our answer off of the table in the PowerPoint, or like the comparison in the in the yeah. PowerPoint video um hang on so weight loss is more crash dieting and improper training that occurs quickly with it's more temporary mm -hmm. and then fat loss is correct nutrition and training and takes time um and it happens more long term and like the behavioral difference is like in weight in Weight loss, you don't change your behaviors. You just get rid of the weight. But in fat loss, you actually change your behavior. Well, that's the goal, is to change your behaviors. It's easy for me to say, decrease intake, increase expenditure. And that's the easy formula. And the hardest part of this whole discussion on weight control is to change the behaviors that led you to overeat to begin with. If you are just losing weight, and when I would see folks who lost weight quickly, if I saw somebody lose more than like one to two pounds in a week, I would say these aren't changes that are, they can last because they're making drastic changes, they're starving themselves, they're going on some kind of fad diet, and they're seeing a change in a number on the scale. But that number could be water weight, could be lean body mass, and there could be some fat. But unfortunately, when you lose weight quickly, you gain it back quickly. If you're somebody who eats under stress, you go on a diet, you lose a lot of weight, and then you go off the diet. If you haven't learned how to deal with the stress, if you haven't learned how to deal with the situations that led you to overeat to begin with, then once you're in that type of situation again, the next time you're in a stressful situation, you go back to the same behaviors and the weight comes back and the fat comes back. So yes, that's why fat loss is slow. It takes time. But more often than not, it's changes that people can live with. It's just that people want to see a fast change. People want to see an easy fix. And it doesn't work that way. So, 
So kind of own that information in the next minute or two and then come back to the classroom and then we're gonna go classroom. And we'll go through these because I just wanna make sure that everybody has all the same information, okay? And I'll see you in a bit. Professor, you're muted. Well, that didn't work out well for me. <laughs> so, hi everybody, welcome back to my classroom. <laughs> so how are the, how are you having discussions in breakout rooms? I know you can hear me now, because I was told. Good. Is it a, is it a way of just getting information with each other? I mean, is it, I don't know the question. Are any, what are your other professors doing in terms of getting you to work on information? Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Some of my professors are using breakout rooms too. Okay. okay. Huh. Abby, what are your professors doing for class discussions or information? I've done breakout rooms. Um, yeah. I don't know how to make them any more exciting. I can't bring you M&Ms or give you cookies, so. All right, so let's go through the questions. Um, just one person from each group, just kind of summarize what you talked about. And let's see. All right, so the first group, explain how surface area affects, is involved in energy expenditure. Right, so. Uh... Firstly, a higher surface area leads to you to use more energy and have a faster basal metabolic rate when compared to someone with a smaller surface area. So that'd be like someone taller versus someone shorter. And also uh, surface area affects maintaining body temperature. So someone with a higher surface area would require more calories and burn more calories for maintaining body temperature, also known as homeostasis, versus someone who's shorter, uh, doesn't have to burn as much calories to maintain the proper body temperature. Okay. All right, group two, somebody from group two. The difference between leptin and ghrelin and weight and going into Hi. the business of manufacturing drugs. Ethan, Ethan, you have your name on your, are you using your yeah. own computer now? No, I renamed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can change it back. Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's not, I can see. Um, so uh, leptin and ghrelin are two um, like hormones basically that control your hunger levels. Leptin um, making you less hungry and ghrelin making you more hungry. Like, hopefully I didn't just make that up. But um, so the question was if you were to make a medication to help with weight loss, which like what, how would you go about doing it? So we, our group talked about maybe making leptin, like a, a leptin supplement or maybe like a ghrelin inhibitor in order to control your like craving. And explain one of the things we talked about was the set point theory, that your body is supposed to be at a certain weight. And how are leptin and ghrelin involved when your weight changes? Do you remember what we were saying about that? Uh, yeah, so basically if you were to lose weight, then your ghrelin levels would increase, making you more hungry to try to get you back to your set point. And uh, vice versa, if you were to gain weight, your leptin levels would increase. 
Okay, good. All right, somebody from group three, hypertrophic versus hyperplastic obesity. Bueller, Bueller. Sharon, did you, were you the one that was? Right, so, um, hyper, I lose myself, but, um, Oops, we just, I just lost your sound. I think it was hyperplasia that was uh, the fat cells growing in size. And uh, that's number. Hyperplasia is number. Okay, hyperplasia is the one that grows in number, and hypertrophic is one that grows in size. So, how it relates to weight loss is that it, once it grows in size, uh, grows in number it's difficult for it to uh, you can shrink it by doing exercise and things like that but it's difficult uh, the number will still remain the same so it, make, it makes weight loss difficult in terms of um, losing the side uh, losing the number sorry it gets those two mixed up all the time well there may be a time when you need to remember the difference but right now we'll let you pass okay and group number four the difference between weight loss and fat loss and why it's important to know the difference? Um, we talked about how um, fat loss is what a lot of people are ideally seeking when they say that they want to lose weight. It's um, if you have fat loss, it's like easier to maintain. You lose not just your water weight; it's more long term. Um, but weight loss could be anything from like water weight and just like doing bad diets and stuff like that. Right. One of the things when I was talking with them is that I've seen, when I would work with patients on weight loss, when I would see somebody lose more than, let's say, one to two pounds a week, I would know that it wasn't sustainable, that they'd gone on some kind of crash diet or some dramatic behavior change that couldn't last. While we talk about intake, when I talk about intake and expenditure in the videos, I think I also try to emphasize that the hardest part, though, is not intake or expenditure, but behavior change. Unless you change the behaviors that lead you to overeat to begin with, you're going to put that weight back on. That's why fad diets may not be sustainable. Certainly all diets work while you're on them, but come back to me in two years and let's see how we're doing with the weight loss. I don't know if I said this to your class, but I used to weigh about 20 pounds more than I do now. And for me, it wasn't until I stopped dieting. And I know that sounds really corny, but I stopped paying attention. I stopped obsessing about the, the numbers. I was also in graduate school, so I knew what I was supposed to eat. Um, I also quit drinking and stopped smoking, but I don't know how much that accounted for anything. But it, you know, the behavior change over time. So I try to work with people, like if somebody likes fast food, I'll say, why don't you get a Happy Meal or a kid's meal? You know, because if your quality of life is going to be awful because you can't eat fast food, let's find a way to keep fast food in your diet. But just, it's not what you eat, it's how much you eat. So, any questions on what we covered? All right, if anybody has any suggestions on what else to do, how else to do the breakout rooms, are they too big, should I have more questions, please let me know. I'm learning this like you're learning it. I appreciate any feedback that you can give me. So next week, if you guys don't mind, um, do, if you want to talk to me on Tuesday, send me an email and I can set up, you know, I can set up a Zoom so that we can talk. Otherwise, I'm just going to be downstairs watching TV or taking a walk. But since we don't have class till Thursday, okay, so I'll be available if you need me. Just let me know what you need and I'll, I'll get back to you. And otherwise... There are videos for you to watch. There's collages for you to make. There's knowledge for you to attain. Hey, and Professor. Then, pardon? I had a question before we end. Um, with the collage, since normally we would be um, like, you know, turning that in in class, how do we go about turning it in online? Like a picture of it? Yeah, email it. Like cut and paste yeah. things, put them in, do a die. yeah. Okay. Thank you. If anybody doesn't mind sticking around for a minute after everybody leaves, just to, if you want to give me any feedback, I would be grateful. Otherwise, any other questions? Yes. Um, so are we going to be doing our presentations on Thursday? 
instead of the for your good health paper. Oh, were we doing it that soon? I think that if we look, what was the date? It's on the, no. the new syllabus. On like the 21st of April. It's April 22nd, I think. 22nd, close. Well, no, I don't know. It's my husband's birthday. I think it, no, maybe it's not the 22nd. Maybe it is the 21st. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I sent out an updated syllabus. Can somebody, does somebody have it offhand? I should. Let me see. Updated syllabus. I have the 23rd. Okay. Both off. Oh, that's right. I was supposed to ask you, did you guys get, in, did y'all get in touch with each other? Of course you did. I don't need to know. So yeah, make sure you get in touch with your groups. I did talk to um, Josephine. She's not going to be able to be part of a group. She's in Indonesia. She's 11 hours ahead. So we worked out something different. I asked her to get in touch with whoever was part of her group and let you know. Um, otherwise, yeah, no, not Thursday. Thanks, Amanda. In case anybody else hadn't looked at it. I know you have a lot going on. I know. So I'm glad you brought that up. No, please. Nothing. Yeah. But like I said, if anybody wants to stick around for a minute afterwards just to give me feedback, I'd appreciate it. Otherwise, you go now. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.